conversation with an important leader in our community, Suffolk County District Attorney Rachel Rollins. We are thrilled that DA Rollins is here to talk with us today about women and the criminal justice system and to answer our questions. This is the first joint event sponsored by the Metro West Women's Fund and Women Aid of Boston. My name is Rebecca Parkhill and with Rachel Sagan, we're the co-founders of the Metro West Women's Fund. We created the Metro West Women's Fund in March of 2019 to support and invest in women and girls through education, grant making, and community building in the 33 towns in Metro West Boston. Women Aid Boston is dedicated to supporting programs that empower teenage girls and women in the greater Boston area. Women Aid Boston is a women's giving circle, which means for those unfamiliar with the term, that the members pool individual contributions in order to make significant grants to greater Boston nonprofits. Thanks to Women Aid Boston and Women Aid members, Christine Swistro, Karen Blinderman, Abby Detweiler, and Pam Messenger for partnering with us on this program. So we are delighted to welcome our main speaker, Suffolk County District Attorney Rachel Rollins. District Attorney Rollins is Massachusetts's first black woman district attorney. She was elected on a progressive platform that challenges the traditional tough on crime law and order policies of the past and has spoken out about outdated criminal justice laws that have led to the disproportionate criminalization of Blacks and Latinos, as well as to unjust sentencing that has led to crowded jails throughout the Commonwealth. Today, District Attorney Rollins will speak for about 15 minutes on the topic of women and the criminal justice system, and then take our questions. And one housekeeping note is that DA Rollins is a very, very busy person, as everyone knows, I'm sure. And she has a case she needs to zoom into at about 1230. And we are delighted to have with us General Counsel Donna Padalano of the Suffolk County DA's office to take questions during the second half of our program. So if you have a question for DA Rollins or Counselor Padalano, please type it into the chat. And again, we welcome you, District Attorney Rollins. Thank you so much. And I apologize uh, for, for being a little late in the beginning. I wanna make sure we get as much time as possible. Um, my hope is that my, my remarks are not 15 minutes, so we have more time for talking, but I did prepare remarks for today. So it is a complete honor to be here with you guys today. And um, you know, I like to say, I always love being in a room full of women or now it's like a Zoom full of women, but there's a sense of sisterhood and solidarity shared struggle and triumph. And even if there's not shared experience and goals, um, we all have um, the similarity uh, of the fact that we're women. And um, this experience though is very rare. I can't count the number of times um, that I'm the only woman in any given room. Like it is too frequent that when I walk in as the chief law enforcement officer of Suffolk County, um, that I am the only woman um, in those room of leaders. And when you're the only one, you often feel a responsibility and a burden to speak up for a group. Um, but as you all know, we can't speak for all women. I, I can't speak even for uh, all women of color or all black women. Each of us have our own lived experience and perspectives and our own way of moving through the world. Um, but that's why we need to lead and speak up and stand out individually because who we are will always inform what we do and how we do it. Events like today are a reminder of women's tremendous capacity to lead. And I think our individual successes are amplified by our collective resolve. I truly believe that empowered women empower women. As Suffolk County's uh, first woman DA in the history of Suffolk County dating back to I believe 1806, um, I am the 16th district attorney and the first woman in Suffolk County and the first um, Massachusetts DA elected of, of woman of color. Um, I do feel the pressure of being a first uh, to enact the change I promised and fight a system designed to function for the benefit of the few and the expense uh, at the expense of the many. I know that the stakes are high, literally life and death when you are the chief law enforcement officer but I take comfort in knowing that women have a unique ability 
to drive change. We've always paved the path towards success. We demanded the right to vote when so many wanted us silenced. Uh, we organized boycotts and sit-ins in the segregated South when so many wanted us to move to the back of the bus. We argued for equal pay and equal work in front of the highest court in the nation. And then we were selected to serve as a member of that very body and may Justice Ginsburg's memory be a blessing and a revolution to all of us. Women have against all odds pushed for change. Some women have benefited more from that change. Race, class, gender identity, orientation, ethnicity have made those victories qualified for many women, particularly black women. Remember that when the 19th Amendment passed, it was not granted, uh, it did not grant suffrage for all women, only white women. The complexities of having an intersectional identity continues to inform women's experience of equality and justice. Breonna Taylor knows this all too well. I decided to run for office because I was tired. It seemed like every time I turned on the television, there was an officer involved shooting. Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Eric Gardner, Laquan McDonald, Freddie Gray. And now as district attorney, the list continues to grow. George Floyd, Elijah McClain, Jacob Blake, who yes, lived, but is permanently disabled, Ahmaud Arbery, Jonathan Price. There is an epidemic of violence against black and brown communities, but so often that conversation focuses on the murders of black men. In 2000, since 2015, 48 black women have been killed by the police. About five days after the death of 18-year-old Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, 50-year-old Michelle uh, Cousseau was shot and killed within seconds of the police encountering her during a mental health call. Black trans women suffer a disproportionate level of violence, not just from police, but from those who devalue their lives, their identities, their very existence. These women matter. Their lives mattered. They should be remembered. We should work to change uh, in their memory. Kimberly Crenshaw is a black feminist academic who first coined the term in, internet, uh, intersectionality. She loved and saw how black women um, and, and noticed, uh, she loved black women, but she noticed how black women were being forgotten within the broader movement for change, which is why she started the Say Her Name campaign. You know, I like to point out that the civil rights movement uplifted black men. Uh, the women's movement uplifted white women. And in both of those movements, black women were often forgotten. Kimberly Crenshaw said, it is the reality of living life in a black body that makes you more subject to police violence. Now, if that body happens to be gendered as something other than male, it also makes you vulnerable to being misremembered. We must remember Breonna Taylor, Taisha Miller, Rakia Boyd, Chantel Davis, Miriam Carney, Kendra James, Sandra Bland. We must speak loudly against injustice and oppression when we see it. Then we must use every single resource at our disposal to dismantle those systems and rebuild with an eye toward equality for all, not just the privileged few. Prosecutors are uniquely positioned to shake up the system. They have a responsibility to serve community that includes victims, witnesses, their families, and neighbors, and also guys, it includes defendants. Anyone who does not understand that the Commonwealth versus Rachel Rollins, if they don't understand that Rachel Rollins is part of that Commonwealth as well, they don't understand the system. If they don't understand that Rachel Rollins is today's defendant, but potentially tomorrow's victim or witness, they don't understand the system. If we embrace that perspective, if we understand the collateral consequences of our decisions and how they reverberate throughout the community, then we can start exploring the best ways to ensure public safety. If you have a person that thinks public safety is just about having more police, they don't understand the system. If they don't understand that housing, education, um, access to healthcare, access to green spaces and good healthy foods, um, job security, if they don't understand how all of those things impact crime, they should not be speaking about this issue and they need to go back and educate themselves a little bit more before they um, start interrupting people that actually know how the system works.
Accountability does not always require incarceration. Wealth should never dictate liberty and treatment should not be subordinate to punishment. I want to implore or an explore meaningful reform around mental health, substance use, food and housing insecurity and poverty and homelessness, which is what the overwhelming majority of individuals that touch our criminal legal system in the municipal and district courts are experiencing. Um, mental, a mental health crisis, substance use disorder, food and housing insecurity, poverty and homelessness. That is what brings people in contact with the criminal system, legal system overwhelmingly. And when we think this way, it's not just the smart thing to do, it's the right thing to do. Um, why I propose that there were 15 different areas of um, categories of nonviolent, non-serious crimes that in the first instance, we would be thinking about alternative solutions rather than jail. These are nonviolent, non-serious crimes. Um, is because these are societal failures that we are the catch basin at the end of a system with in the criminal legal system. Um, I'm trying to change a system that was created by and for people who do not look like me, but with people like me directly in mind. And I say people like me, poor people and black and brown people in that order are most disproportionately impacted by our current criminal legal system. I have siblings that have cycled in and out of this system who have struggled with substance use disorders and have mental health issues. And I'm the guardian of two of my nieces because of those realities. Um, our nation's history is ugly and runs deep. It's not just our original sin, racism, it's our mutating virus. We went from slavery to Jim Crow to mass incarceration. And if we truly wanna heal, we need to confront the underlying wound Funding programs and passing policies while failing to talk about racial injustice is like putting a Band-Aid on a gaping, <coughs> bleeding wound. It will not stop the bleeding. It will not stop the harm. We need to talk about race and wealth and how it influences our systems and policies. And we need to confront our past in order to build a more just and equitable future. I do want to say before I close um, that there are overwhelming majority of the members of law enforcement that I work with every single day as the chief law enforcement officer of Suffolk County, which is Boston, Chelsea, Winthrop, and Revere, are upstanding, hardworking, um, culturally competent men and women that do a job every day that none of us would sign up for, even if we got three times the pay. Um, they put their lives at risk every day. Um, but I like to point out that law enforcement and communities of color suffer from the same problem with the media. We often only see white male men, men who are members of law enforcement shooting or harming an unarmed black man or woman. That and, and, and thousands of them locally and across our nation that go out to work every day and serve with dignity and compassion and, and care and love um, to protect our communities. And then we also only see overwhelmingly on the, in the media, black men engaged in crime and harm, as opposed to all the wonderful, positive, uplifting things they do as not only brilliant people, but fathers and husbands, um, as hardworking people every day that I see in my community. So when we start changing those narratives and having tough conversations is when we are gonna see change. I hope you will join me in this fight. We, could all, we can absolutely use all the help uh, that we can get right now. And I'd love to be able to take a few questions before I jump on to my next meeting. Okay, um, thank you very much. We have a question that I'm gonna read from the chat. I'm very concerned that relationships between the police and people of color have become adversarial. So this is to your, the point you were just making. I believe that learning about one another is a better way to improve relationships and redu reduce treating people of color less fairly than white people. Are there any steps you are taking or plan to take that will increase the dialogue? I particularly think that the dialogue between Henry Louis Gates and the officer who arrested him for going into his own home is a prime example of learning from one another. I love it, right? And that happened right here in Cambridge, right? As a result of the president um, having a beer summit. Um, and I'm not encouraging beer, beer drinking or alcoholism <laughs> here, but um, you know, June 1st, I made a statement with Mayor Walsh. And if any of you have seen it, um, 
you know, it was impassioned and um, emotional. Uh, and many of my law enforcement partners were not happy with some of this, some of the things that I said during that statement. And I was proud that they felt comfortable enough to tell me that because I think when we disagree, if you respect somebody enough, you tell them, you don't just talk trash behind their back. I like to say out loud, I have no problem saying anything to the media because I would only say it if I've already said it to the person that I'm talking about. Right. So, um, what I did was after June 1st, which I also spoke to my staff that day and, and, and discussed um, the state of America as a result of the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, which is what we were dealing with back then. I then convened a meeting of all of my um, commissioners, colonels, and chiefs. I only have six in Suffolk County, so Colonel Mason of the State Police, Commissioner Gross, Boston, Chief Green of the Transit Police, Delahanty of Winthrop, Callahan of Revere, and Kais of Chelsea. And I wrote them a letter that said, I am, this is a mandatory meeting as the chief law enforcement officer. We are gonna have a confidential, no holds barred discussion about race, policing, and the black community. And this will be the, one of many discussions and we are going to um, listen to each other and hear because you need to hear me say my statements on June 1st were reserved. I, I said about a quarter of what I meant. So if you were terrified and uncomfortable, get ready for what you were about to hear. And I will also get ready and actively listen, not on my phone, not rolling my eyes, not interrupting, listening actively to what it is that you were saying. Our first meeting was June 18th, it was scheduled to go for an hour. It went for almost two hours and 15 minutes. We have had about five or six meetings since then. Um, we do not agree about everything, but this is an arranged marriage. I have made it clear to them, gentlemen, I'm going nowhere until I you know, choose not to be DA or the wonderful people of Suffolk County say, thank you so much, we've had enough. We would like the next person and that is what it is. For the next four years, we can either battle every battle and battle it out in the media, or we can have open conversations about what we disagree with. And you have to trust me enough that I will never share what it is you said to me. And when I prove that trust and loyalty back to you, we can move forward. But I am your biggest ally and supporter, even when I disagree with you, and I hope vice versa. Right? If I'm out there saying things that aren't true because I've never been a police officer, I look foolish and then all of law enforcement looks foolish. When they push back and say, don't do that, or you know, these meetings have now morphed not just about race into my lead database, right? which is our disclosure list of bad police officers. If I show them the respect of saying, gentlemen, I am under obligation by you know, our, our statutes and laws in the Commonwealth to turn this information over to the media who made a public records request, but I can show them the respect of giving them the list hours before I give it to the media. Why would I make Commissioner Gross and Colonel Mason and Kais, Delahanty, um, Green and Callahan have to read the Herald to see who their officers are? Right. I met with them. I talked to them about what it was I was going to do. I gave them that Excel spreadsheet prior to giving it to the media. I then met with the union leadership, which never happens. Right. As a daughter of a very proud daughter of two union members, management is just management and they're very important. Don't get me wrong. The presidents of the unions are the ones that have their fingers directly in what is happening with the men and women that are serving us and people that are serving us every day um, on the lines uh, as police officers. So I then had a meeting with all the union leadership, uh, leadership, only the presidents, not the union members, but, you know, so there's one colonel of the state police, two presidents of the unions. There's one commissioner Gross of the Boston police, four presidents of the unions. We made sure we had that meeting. And now I said to them, we're gonna meet quarterly, whether you, you, know, you can show up or not, but I'm gonna be available to meet with you quarterly. And we're gonna talk about some of the stuff we're proposing because I am not here to make your life a living hell. I'm doing what it is I think is right and just. And I have no problem if I am 
doing what I think is right and just is looking at you and saying, Lauren Morton, this is why I want to make sure that any officer who has been arrested, not just in Suffolk County, but in Matt in Milton, which is one inch from Suffolk County, or Prague, which is not, if you are, you know, arrested for domestic violence, I don't care where it is. I want to know that because that is information that is necessary for me to see. Are you testifying in domestic violence cases? Did, is this, does this go to your tr truthfulness or um, credibility? Let's start talking about this, right? And we have had, it is one of the most positive things I've seen, Chris, honestly, in the, since June 18th, the fact that these gentlemen show up to these, and these are busy men, don't get me wrong, right? They are keeping us safe every day. Colonel Mason has 2,300 state troopers in Massachusetts. Commissioner Gross has 2,100 Boston police officers, detectives, lieutenants, all the way up. These are busy, busy people. They are on time, they are active, and we meet easily now more than once a month. And it has been one of the most positive things I've seen, the growth that I have had personally, and I hope that they have had as well, and the trust that we are starting to build with each other. Yeah, if you have time for another, and I know how busy Chief Kais is, I live in Chelsea actually. And um, he's wonderful. And he's a good example, Chris, of like, Chief Kais tells the story of when he went to Chelsea High School, Chelsea was 3%. 3% Latinx when he, and he's not 105 years old. He's like a you know, 50, 60 year old gentleman, right? It is now over 60% Latinx. And he is still the chief of police through many different leadership structures, right? And his, his police force has adjusted with the community that it is there and duty bound to protect and serve. So that's what leadership and cultural competency looks like. Chief Kais is not a man of color, but he is really beloved and leading in the Commonwealth and Chelsea because of his cultural competency. I like to say Justice Ginsburg, uh, Chief Justice Gantz, who we just lost on our Supreme Judicial Court, has done immense work for communities that they were not a part of themselves living lived experience, but cultural competence is so important in this, these positions. So follow up um, related, how would you think about restructuring the, the way police departments work, how police are trained, how their jobs are reframed? And I think related, we have another question, which is um, thoughts about whether uh, social workers might be co-responding to calls with the police. You're on mute. Sorry, I'm, as I said, let's start backwards. I love that idea, right? Like social workers, when we think about officer involved shootings in Massachusetts, there is some startling statistic, like almost 50% of them are people in crisis, right? They're, they're a person with a mental health crisis. And even if they're being dangerous, which I need to be very clear, there are circumstances that are tragic for sure. Um, but the police are justified in protecting the community, protecting themselves. They can't enter a situation and, and escalate it such that they have to use lethal force. But there are many times that we, as my administration, as a black woman, am going to find the police were reasonable and justified in this encounter. Is it still tragic that someone lost their lives? Of course it is. But the police were protecting the community or themselves from a person that was going to harm. Um, social workers should be deployed. There should be another number that isn't 911, right? For, 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 for certain interactions. If you have a loved one that is, um, you know, has a diagnosed, you know, DSM-5 mental health issue, right? Um, you don't want, you just want help. You just want them to either come in from outside or stop harming themselves. If we have experts that can come and assist us with things like that, I think that's a win. And I think honestly, guys, even if you spoke with the most conservative police officer in the world, that you might think the two of us would be 70 miles that way, me, and 170 miles that way, them, we will agree on the fact that we're asking the police to do too much right now. We are certainly asking the police to do too much. I heard a statistic the other day that firefighters, something like less than 30% of what they do is fight fires. They are like, you know, 
taking kittens out of trees, showing up at cat, you know, at, at car accidents. They're doing tons of other things that are helping us, but we need to be better at making sure we are not using the police for everything. Um, so that's number one. And then how would I look at sort of reallocating this? You know, we have a Boston Police Department with a budget, an operating budget of $414 million and a, an overtime budget of $60 million. Mayor Walsh has said that he's going to take 20% of that $60 million overtime budget and reallocate those um, funds, whether that is going to end up being a reallocation for this new um, task force that uh, that he put together that he just um, adopted all of their findings. That's $12 million that can start that new um, entity. But, you know, I think we need to start giving communities more resources to um, be involved in um, public safety. And I don't mean giving them guns. I'm talking about, you know, what, when we think about public safety, if you think about my opening remarks, it's not about more police. It's about better schools. It's about housing for people, right? It is about environmental racism, which is very real. When we think about a place like Chris Chelsea, right, that has the Tobin Bridge going through it, Logan Airport flying over it, and the, one of the largest food just private food distribution centers in the country, which means 18-wheeler trucks coming in. And Chelsea, the, the population in Chelsea, they didn't have the time to say, please don't build the, the Tobin Bridge here. But you know who does? Like Wellesley, right? Or our W towns, Wabin, Winchester, Wellesley, you know, uh, Weston, right? Um, who are able to say to their electeds, no, NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard, not here. And it goes to the places where there's working class people who are just trying to pay their rent and raise their children and now homeschool. And also many of them are on IEPs and English language learners that are going to have an even wider education gap for them. So we have to think differently about what public safety looks like how we are allocating our budget, right? That's a love language, right? Show me your budget and it tells me what you value, right? And um, making sure that we are having police on and at the very table when we're making these decisions. We can't do it without them. Now, maybe they don't get a megaphone and like 99% of the speaking time, but you bet they have to be there because we need their expertise to decide how we're gonna move forward and things are gonna look different in the future. Um, you guys are gonna be left in incredibly capable hands uh, with respect to Donna Patilano, who I like to say, um, Suffolk County is lucky to have two district attorneys. Um, many of you know Donna uh, ran for district attorney in Middlesex County. Um, and although I work with DA Ryan and she is um, a, a colleague and a, and a peer and a friend. Um, Donna is a, a brilliant person in Suffolk County. We are lucky to have her um, here as our general counsel so she can very ably answer everything else for you. I'm gonna jump into a hearing, but keep up the hard work, ladies. We have a lot Thank of work to do. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so no. much for your time today. Thank, Thank you. Well. you. All right, Donna, knock them dead. Thanks, Thanks Rachel. Hi, Donna. Um, Hi, how are you? Great. So sh I'm going to continue with our, the questions and I'll ask folks to um, add your questions to the chat and I will do my best to get to all of them. I think related to what Rachel was just talking about, um, two things. One is um, how do we uh, contend with the language around defunding the police, which seems very confrontational, mm -hmm. um, but, but affect um, the kind of action that Rachel was talking about, which is thinking about housing first and food safety and health care, which is something that um, your audience today in large measure with Women Aid Boston and Metro West Women's Fund, we can influence so um, with our funding. So I'd love to hear about what, sure. what, you know, how to make the defunding the police concept positive 
Um, right. Well, I think, you know, Rachel really touched upon part of that. Well, first, I want to say, you know, as you well know, one of the challenges that we have is the way that the system is siloed, right? As the district, as, as Rachel said, as district attorney, we have control over certain things and we can certainly influence. And I think one of the ways that Rachel has been extraordinary is using her powerful voice you know, to meet with her partners in law enforcement, to meet with her partners in uh, the executive office of public safety, um, you know, people who are reporting up to the governor to make sure that we're, we're touching as many different parts of the system as we possibly can, because we recognize that as the safety net, um, you know, as a district attorney and the prosecutor is the safety net, we catch people at the very last bit. Um, and the, and the, typical response has been incarceration. And Rachel wants to make sure that that is not the typical response and to change that mindset in our office. And I will say we, we've we had some success. You know, we advocated to the mayor to take some of the overtime budget. That last month they um, announced that that overtime budget or a portion of it was gonna to go towards uh, 15 more social workers who work out of the Boston Medical Center but are assigned essentially to the Boston Police Department because police officers now are, are uh, acting as social workers in a lot of um, situations when they're going to report, they're being put in very difficult positions. And I, and I think some of the difficult language that we um, express uh, gets, um, uh, fractured by the media, but the conversations that we're having with our partners are really fulsome, which is wonderful. And we're doing that in the legislation as well. The first legislation that Rachel testified in support of was for funding for education. Um, you know, that it's not right that in Chelsea, it's, uh, you know, a certain amount of money uh, per student. And in, I'm in Winchester. In Winchester, it's probably twice that amount. How can that be appropriate uh, and, and equitable? It certainly isn't. And so Rachel um, testified um, strongly in, in um, support of making some equity across education. Um, uh, but it education funding, but it's challenging, right? Because what we're trying to do is divert as many um, of those sort of low level cases where social workers or social services would be the right response and not uh, the criminal legal system. What are your, what are the thoughts of the off your office on the current bail system and its impact on poor women in particular? Yeah, I, I, um, you know, we've had a lot of conversation about the bail system. Um, Rachel is constantly saying, uh, you know, that she wants to really advocate for no cash bail at all. Um, and one of the challenges that we have is uh, we have the bail statute and we have the dangerousness statute. How somebody is held um, when they're a danger and the challenges of holding somebody for um, dangerousness under the current statute. So we're working uh, with some legislatures to, to try to uh, change the dangerousness statute because previously, and look, I started as a prosecutor in 2002, um, even as an older law student, and one of the, cha I, I, I mean, I remember specifically in those days saying, we're holding somebody for $100 um, and uh, thinking, okay, the community is gonna be safer for that. Um, but having learned, as, as everybody in our office has, that that person being held because they're too poor to pay $100 is losing their job and losing their apartment um, and losing whatever social, you know, social security systems, not, uh, not the social security, but the, the systems around them, uh, so that when they are eventually released, because they will be released, <laughs> you know, short of first degree murder, everybody is going to be released. Um, so making sure that um, that doesn't happen anymore. So we've put in a new bail policy. Uh, we're trying to educate our prosecutors about using the appropriate considerations for bail and when it is appropriate um, to make sure that we ensure that they come back for the next uh, court hearing. But then also building out capacity um, to send people, to divert people to social services. The challenge that we have is, you know, the beds are full. Um, the programs are full, and COVID has only um, distressed the system even more. Um, and so the funding for those programs, um, it would be wonderful if we could take some of the funding um, from, you know, overtime 
uh, but that budget doesn't flow to us when it when the um, city of Boston doesn't send it to the Boston Police Department any longer. So um, so those are the challenges. It's <laughs> this is hard work. I know that you're all involved in this kind of hard work and appreciate that, um, but it's hard work and it's constant and the urgency is real and COVID-19 has only really pushed that urgency. Change just isn't a given. Um, we have to demand change and that's part of why it's so thrilling to work for a principal like Rachel Rollins who is just keeps pushing, pushing, and pushing. Um, one of the questions or comments in the chat, which I think um, is an, an important point, is um, how you work with um, police accountability in the police unions, which, mm -hmm. um, you know, the concern is that they become the barrier to the kind of innovation that you're talking about. Yeah. And how how are you working through that, or what what are your yeah. strategies for that? So I am a child of a union family, and so I you know I, it feels funny to be on this side. Um, and when we released our lead database, as Rachel mentioned, the law enforcement automatic discovery, it's police officers who are even you know have been prosecuted or convicted or are under investigation or have been found by a judge not to be credible. But one of the challenges we have is we don't know what police officers are subject to internal affairs uh, investigations. They won't give us that information. And we found out that information, believe it or not, from the Boston Globe. Um, and so that has been a, a constant conversation that we are having with our law enforcement partners. We have an obligation as prosecutors to let defendants know that somebody that is testifying in a case uh, is subject to an internal affairs uh, finding, a sustained finding, or has been prosecuted. Isn't that critical? If we have a law enforcement officer who has been convicted of a domestic violence offense and is still on the job and he is testifying in a domestic violence case, doesn't that go potentially to bias? Of course it does. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm the person who holds the lead database and, and um, it, so it's been extremely frustrating. I will say the leadership of the law enforcement is um, very receptive to continuing the conversation and to try and figure out how to exchange that information. Um, and it, it hasn't necessarily been that way with the unions. We're working though, we are pushing and pushing. We're gonna get that information one way or the other. And I think the mayor's uh, release yesterday of um, his uh, task force recommendations will potentially help us get there. It's the new normal. I think that's what the police um, our unions are coming to appreciate. And so um, we're hopeful. Uh, can you say more about um, the diversionary program specifically for women? And is there equal funding for women's diversionary programs? Yeah, um, so I, I think right now we don't have a diversion program that specifically addresses um, women or young women in the system. It's, it's a, uh, it's a, right now we have a juvenile diversion program within our um, office. And then the rest of the diversion is um, our assistant district attorneys recognizing um, needs and then uh, um, making connections with community organizations. Um, so I, I want to take that back. I would love to report back to you a little bit about um, numbers and find out some data for you about who is being prosecuted in our office and what the numbers are. So Chris, if that's okay, I'll, I'll be, you'll be my point person for that because I would really love to um, let you know more about that. Um, I know that our juvenile, we have a JAR program, it's Juvenile Alternate Resolution Program, and we've partnered with UMass Boston because I, I will tell you, and they've all been audited um, in the state, all of the um, diversion programs in other district attorney's offices don't measure outcomes. And so our, our thinking was, well, what is the idea if you send uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, one juvenile to program A, um, and you don't measure if program A has had any impact at all, uh, what, is, what, what is going on? I mean, there is no uh, industry where you don't measure outcomes. And so that's what we're doing now. We partnered with uh, UMass Boston um, and other uh, agencies in Boston, and we've been having terrific results, but it is intensive work. Um, we, Rachel has doubled the staff 
of that program. Um, and I will uh, report back to you, Chris, about what the um, breakdown is uh, between women and men. Um, I'm curious now uh, to find out. Great, um, thank you. I'm just reading. Um, yeah. What I just want that? to recognize, um, if I can, um, yeah. Shondell Davis, um, who mentioned in the chat about her son. I think it's been over just over 10 years um, since her, her son was killed. And so, Shondell, I can't see you, but I want to um, recognize you and, and recognize your loss. Maybe you can talk about this, the state of kind of gun violence and, and sort of the movement of guns and how um, women are actually inadvertently involved in gun right. violence. Um, lipstick has been um, a grantee of Women Aid. Um, uh, if you're familiar with them, their yep, mission is to course. help women understand the implications of, of harboring guns for their significant other family members. Um, right. So maybe you could say a little bit about about that. Yeah, I think, you know, it is so frequent that we see a case where uh, women are used either uh, to hold guns, firearms, or um, controlled substances. And, you know, cases where the outcome, the collateral consequences for those women is the loss of a car or the loss of a student grant um, or scholarship because they get entangled in the criminal justice system and working to vacate. Uh, we, we have a pretty robust uh, 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 system in place to vacate convictions and to help um, people um, expunge their records. And there are a um, majority of uh, women who uh, are involved in either expunging um, cases that involve firearms or, or narcotics. Um, and so I think part of what we're working with the uh, Greater Boston Legal Services um, with is to get the word out about expungement and to make sure that women know that this is a process um, that we are engaged in and willing to assent to um, motions for new trial in order to vacate those convictions. So to the extent that your organizations can get that word out, um, the Greater Boston Legal Services has a wonderful website and they have all the information right on the website about expungement. So to the, uh, you know, and we're working on the front end. Um, so there are not charges on, on people's records. It's, it's uh, I think, traumatizing enough for women to get arrested um, because they've done something um, either under coercion or, um, you know, for whatever reason, um, but are not really the, you know, driver of the criminal activity, but are instead, um, you know, the, um, the victim. Uh, and so our ADAs are mindful of that and are trained on um, how to uh, handle uh, cases like that. And uh, certainly on the back end, we want to make sure that people understand that we are open and welcome requests for expungement um, to the extent that now that the uh, statute for expungement has been expanded, that we can uh, work on that or at least seal records. Um, question about women in the I incarcerated. Um, we've heard that women are being moved from MCI Framingham to jails in Boston. Can you share more about what is happening to this population? Um, and I guess a follow on um, from, uh, from me is um, other concern is women coming out of the criminal justice system and ways to mount um, because it seems as though services available to them are quite for um, reentry are quite different than are available to men. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, this is something that's new for our office. I think Rachel has been, uh, you know, in, in part because of her lived experiences, understands how important, um, you know, with a sister who has been incarcerated and who has substance use um, uh, disorder, that she sees, uh, you know, the lack of. Uh, uh, programs available um, to help um, to reintegrate in, into the community. And in part, I think one of Rachel's uh, experiences, I can speak, you know, I hear her speak about uh, frequently is um, the, the way in which um, she was treated uh, as an observer when her sister was uh, being um, tangled in the criminal legal system because of um, 
uh, substance use disorder and uh, because of relationships uh, that she had and um, the lack of dignity. Um, you know, what I will tell you is we partnered with Vera this year, a Vera Institute, which is out of New York. And just yesterday, we had a mandatory web webinar for all of our assistant district attorneys about dignity about treating everybody in the courtroom with dignity. Um, and that's something that is lacking both in the courtroom and, uh, um, uh, and uh, as people are leaving um, incarceration. I know that um, MCI Framingham has had problems both with um, just the facility and with COVID particularly, and that there is some um, movement, but we're not provided that information. Um, there was a law passed in 2018 that other, um, uh, that about criminal justice agencies sharing uh, data. And we have yet to get that data. The only data that we receive is data that the Supreme Judicial Court mandated be shared with us uh, following litigation about COVID-19. Um, so I can't really speak meaningfully about um, what's happening in MCI um, Framingham and how it might be impacting um, the Suffolk Sheriff's uh, facilities. Um, what I would like to, though, an answer is about the restorative justice, um, because we have a pretty robust program in um, Suffolk County. It's led by Kara Hayes, who's also on the gover uh, governor's uh, council about restorative justice. And prior to COVID, um, Kara was going in monthly to, uh, at MCI Norfolk to do circles. Um, she did a circle last uh, week in East Boston. Um, she's trained a number of our staff to run circles. Um, I'm not sure now since COVID, we haven't been able to go into the um, into the DOC, into the Department of Correction facilities. So it's been challenging because um, the people I think who need it most um, are not getting services now. And they're, again, their sentences, but for a very small cohort, their sentences are going to end. And if we don't prepare them for success um, uh, when they're out, um, that's a, we're wasting money um, because what we're doing is we're spending it way too much on prosecution, on policing, on prosecution, and on, on incarceration. And if we could just refocus on reentry um, or diversion on both those ends of the system, um, I think you know we would be able to um, really have an impact on um, improving the quality of life and more importantly as the mission of the district attorney's office on community safety on public safety um, because releasing somebody who has not um, you know uh, been ha had an opportunity to rehab or not had an opportunity to have mental health counseling um, you're setting that person up for failure um, and and we're spending eighty thousand dollars a year now i think is the, uh, the cost to incarcerate somebody um, and if we spent instead the $15,000 a year across the board equitably in education systems on students, um, it just would make so much more sense. And the challenge that we have, the urgency that Rachel feels is that, um, again, it's siloed. And uh, she is using her platform and her voice as much as possible to impact um, other agencies, other budgets, other uh, funding and um, she won't stop. I guarantee you, well, she will not stop. As you look around the landscape in Suffolk County and sort of beyond, um, what is the trajectory for um, for change? I know it's you know there's a lot of advocacy, but maybe you could just touch on um, you know the kind of policies that are, are being advocated and how progress is being made and sort of what's over the horizon. Yeah, so there are a couple of things that I can point out. First, the trajectory has to be uh, powered by data. Um, data is the most important piece and uh, because we, again, we need to measure outcomes and find out what, what is happening. We've been struggling with that. We actually have a case management um, uh, case information system from 2004, okay? That's like, I think, 10 generations in IT tech, uh, 2004. It is a system 
that is held by the Mass District Attorneys Association. So there are 11 DAs. The funding from the State House goes into the MDAA, and then they create, they create the IT. You can imagine thinking about the different district attorneys um, that not everybody wants to have data transparency like Rachel Wallens does, or um, maybe even DA Ryan or DA Sullivan want to have, um, and DA um, Harrington out in Berkshire County. So um, changing that system has been a huge priority. Uh, we're basically creating a, we're doing everything we can in our budget to create a, a data system of our own. Um, so data is, is, is job number one in order to inform our policies. Um, you know, she's done the discharge integrity uh, te team. So they're looking at any use of force uh, investigations with an outside uh, board. So there are people who are not partnered with the law enforcement agencies that we're potentially, uh, that we are investigating when we look at um, use of force incidences. We're involved in the ICE lawsuit um, about the, uh, you know, trying to work on the draconian federal immigration laws. We have no control over that, but we can keep, keep ICE out of our courthouses. And that's been uh, wonderful. We have the lead database um, that I've already talked about. We have an immigration policy. Again, we can't control the federal immigration law, um, but what we can do is say, if you have a conviction on your record and you're um, in um, uh, danger of being deported because of that conviction, come to us. Uh, we'll work to vacate that conviction under a pretty broad um, cri a set of criteria, um, and then um, you won't be deported. I was involved in a case that I argued in front of the SJC on that, and last week, I have to tell you, brought tears to my eyes. Um, the person in that case got his green card uh, because we uh, worked on, on uh, his. So that's the power of a district attorney who's willing to work progressively and think outside of the box. It isn't just talk. Uh, we're impacting lives and it's an amazing uh, work and it's amazing to be working for somebody like Rachel. Um, so to the extent that you all have ideas, please bring them to us. We welcome that kind of conversation. I know that you are um, engaged with so many different community partners. If you have ideas, please bring them to us. Uh, we're sort of dealing <laughs> with the flow every day of what happens. And sometimes we just don't get the chance to step back and say, okay, let's think big picture. What do we want to do? In fact, I've been, uh, you know, on Rachel, let's get, get a uh, appointment on the calendar so we can do our top five uh, priorities. If you have ideas, please, I'm asking you, bring them to us. We welcome them and, and would love to um, have that conversation with you. Well, we're just about at the end of the hour. I'm going to hand it back to Rebecca. Thank you so much, Donna. There are a few extra questions that we haven't gotten to, but um, maybe we can group those together and send them along. Um, yeah, and, and I'll respond to you too about uh, the question specifically about um, women in the system and, and, and diversion, um, how it impacts women um, in our system. I thank you so much for letting me um, uh, back clean up, I guess. You know, uh, Councillor Padalano, it was just wonderful to hear you speak and thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Again, thanks to Rachel Rollins, who is remarkable, and we're thrilled um, that she's here with us in Massachusetts. Also, again, thanks to Women Aid Boston and Chris Swistro, Karen Blinderman, Abby Detweiler, and Pam Messenger of Women Aid Boston for co-sponsoring this program with the Metro West Women's Fund. And thank you all for attending. Thank you for your great questions. Be well, everyone. And um, I think we're going to be following up with just a little, very, very short survey to um, get your feedback on today's programming. Thank you all again. Take care.